Well, good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, can I welcome members, uh, invited guests, and anyone who is watching on the webcast to today's uh, meeting of the Education Panel. Um, the purpose of our meeting today is to explore, hear from our guests about the effect of changes to further education funding, um, the provision, and of course the outcome, and how that's impacting on young Londoners. And um, what we're, we're hoping to get at the end um, of this um, two-hour session with you guests is, is to learn more about um, the different providers' experiences and um, how um, providers are responding to the funding um, challenges. And uh, we'd love to hear about um, the effects that any reduction or cuts is, is having um, on the provision um, for young Londoners. And then uh, with all our recommendations, of course, we really want to know uh, what can be done and um, really our uh, first, if you like, line of attack is for the Mayor. Um, so we, we're going to ask you your views about what more the Mayor can do. But um, as you've seen from our work, we then range wider and we do put recommendations to any, uh, any of the bodies that, if you like, feature in our investigation. Um, so can I formally welcome um, James uh, Kiewin, um, Deputy Chief Executive, Sixth Form Colleges Association. Thank you. Uh, Phil Rossiter, Technical Director of MIME. And we've got Eddie Playfair, Senior Policy Manager of the Association of Colleges. Um, Kevin Gilmartin, Post-16 and Colleges Specialist, Association of School and College Leaders. And we, last but not least, uh, we have with us Lee Powell, the National Officer for Further Education from Unison. Um, so, uh, members uh, have got questions that they will be asking to specific guests or um, uh, if, if you're not asked direct, then please do come in um, with the answers. And um, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to start the questions in a moment. Let me just formally ask for apologies for absence. And we have received apologies from? Yes, we have received apologies from Assembly Member Curtin. Thank you. And um, we have no uh, chair's announcements. And um, item two, can I ask the panel to note the list of offices held by members as set out in the table at item two as disclosable pecuniary interests? Can I ask members if they have any additional interest in specific items listed on the agenda? No, thank you. Um, the minutes, uh, can we confirm the minutes of the meeting of the panel held on 19th September 2019? And can I sign them as correct record? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. And um, let's just do item four, the summary list of actions. Can we please note the outstanding actions arising from previous meetings of the panel? Thank you. And then let's go now to our session with our guests. So um, the first question is to James, Kevin, Eddie and Lee. And it's how have funding changes in the last decade, both in terms of amounts and distribution, impacted on further education in London? Start. Yes, James, yes, please I, do. I, I would kind of look at, there's a lot of talk about funding cuts and there's been a sort of blizzard of reports recently about the, about the extent of funding cuts. But I think it's also important to uh, reflect on the, the other factors that have led to funding pressures. So, for example, 
costs have risen significantly since 2010, uh, as well as funding cuts. Um, big increase in demand from students as well. So students, in, uh, in, in, that, in that respect, they've become more complex in terms of their needs. We've seen a big increase, for example, in mental health uh, issues uh, amongst young people during that time. We've also seen uh, lots of requests from government, so government's asking us to do more. So I think when you combine the funding cuts, it's three big cuts to funding since 2010, um, but also cost increases, uh, greater demand from students and what government is asking us to, to do. I think, so in a sense, it's often the narrative is that the impact of funding cuts. I suppose I would say that it's funding pressures in the round that have been uh, very sort of uh, problematic. And the impact, the, the most recent data, we are all part of the, the Raise the Rate campaign that's aimed at increasing funding for sixth form education. And in our last survey, we talked to schools and colleges across the country, and the results for London were very similar with the results from across uh, the rest of England. And, you know, 51% uh, of schools and colleges have cut uh, modern foreign languages because of funding pressures, 38% of jobs STEM, um, big reductions uh, in student support and extracurricular activities as well. Uh, and the other big thing is, has been uh, uh, increases in class sizes. So the impact on students has been significant. Their courses have been cut, their support's been reduced. The impact on institutions has been bad in terms of financial health. Uh, and longer term, that will have impact, uh, uh, an impact on social mobility and economic uh, productivity as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Um, Chip and Eddie? Agree, yes, ag agree with, with James. Um, the funding rate for 16 to 18 year olds hasn't been changed uh, from the £4,000 basic rate for nearly a decade. Um, and we estimate that, bearing in mind the increase in costs that James referred to, that's probably a quarter of a billion pounds, £250 million pounds that's been taken out effectively from 16 to 18 funding in London. Um, and that's not just colleges, that's, that's in school six forms as well. Mm. Um, and as James says, that, that, that has led inevitably to, I mean, lots of efficiency savings, but it's also inevitably had an impact on the student experience. So course hours have been cut. Uh, we, we know that course hours have been cut. Um, teaching time has been reduced. Student support has been reduced. Um, and all the enrichment and extracurricular activities that make the college experience or the sixth form experience so um, stimulating uh, has also been reduced. So, um, on the other hand, there have been there have been there have been mergers which have led to some mm. of the some of the kind of um, central costs being being reduced. But it has to be said that the system as a whole across London is not functioning terribly efficiently. So that even the money that's there could be better used. Uh, we've got the proliferation of small school sixth form. We might come on to that later, but that. That hasn't. That, that that does mean that the, the, the budget there is is not necessarily being spent as well as it could be, and um, subjects are being withdrawn um, and um, being run very inefficiently in, among too many providers. So there's lots and lots of impacts. Having said that, the quality of the provision that there is in London is still good. Right. And have we had uh, in, um, have we had enough time to be able to? Um assess impact following the mergers that you just talked about, Eddie? Do you I, know? I think it's too early to, too early. to judge. Um, mm. They've certainly helped to, to reduce costs, and they've also helped to uh, increase efficiencies and to protect the mm. sufficiency of the offer to students. So, for example, I'll give one, one concrete example in an area I know well, which is in Tower Hamlets, where um, New City College has created a sixth form centre uh, from two previous sixth form centres, one in uh, Hackney and one in, in, in Poplar. And so the Atlee Centre is able to, to provide a really broad um, A-level offer. And so um, because colleges are larger, they're able to think more strategically and plan more strategically. But again, I, would, I, would, uh, I don't want to over, overstate the case, but I would say that what's needed is that that kind of process probably needs to be, be happening uh, in the, the other half of the system, which is the, the small school six forms, where there's lots of them and they're very small. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank in in you. some cases, smaller than, the, smaller than the size which the government itself recommends mm -hmm. uh, as a lower, the, the, the lower size for, for a viable six form to be opened. 
Mm. Nearly half of them are actually below that size. Yeah. And, and just going to say, whereas there was the legislative requirement for the mergers of FE colleges to get them to a state where we're hoping uh, with the broader offer um, that you've just quoted, once they settle down, to be a much more fit for purpose, um, there's, there's no push, is there, um, against schools um, and uh, what they're doing in their sixth form college, in their sixth form uh, provision. Yeah, so it's, it's really unfinished business from the area review process from a few years ago, mm. where that kind of level of coordination and, and cooperation that, that might um, improve the offer, protect the offer, given the unit of resource being so low, um, hasn't happened. Yeah. Right, so it's a good question about um, what uh, the Department of Education are, are thinking about that or what they're picking up in terms of their monitoring as well. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Kevin. May I just add um, one particular thought about uh, the mergers, which was the, the last question, any impact from more Reese from the mergers that we may be aware of. I think there is a, a consequence that it's likely that students may have to travel a bit further mm -hmm. to get to the place and, and study the mm -hmm. type of subject that they want to study. Mm -hmm. And something that um, anybody who's worked in schools or, or colleges in London where students come from a wide sort of any part of London they're, they're, you know kids don't care about boundaries or which borough they're in they, they go anywhere don't they and not being able to use the tube as a free service I think it, I certainly used to find that as a principal highly as a highly uh, dramatic impact on lots of things and I just wanted to throw that out there in terms of their attendance if they're using buses all the time they're more likely <coughs> to be late not turn up etc 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 so I think that that that's something that hasn't gone away as far as I'm concerned unless the policy has changed and I've missed it so I think that that, that could be a further consequence of having to travel a bit further to to get your your local provision even within London so that that, that is one point I did want to make but um, I, I would say a couple of other thoughts about the the impact <coughs> on funding um, there's th th there's certainly more pressure on the staff as well I know we're talking about the students because the reality of being a member of staff and teaching 15 students your particular subject with class sizes getting bigger and bigger because you have to do that in order to make the books balance you've now got 20 or 25 students and the level of marking and preparation because of that and then at the same time you are being given less time to teach that subject probably if people around this room who did A-levels themselves probably got five, eight, five hours per subject. It's, it's more like four hours 20, four hours 30, some cases four hours now. So they're teaching more subjects within their timetable and they've got less time to deliver to larger class sizes. And that's a very big frustration to a lot of staff. And I know part of the paper is about why staff aren't staying mm -hmm. in London in particular and, and it's so expensive, etc. And there's one other issue which, which I'd like to bring up in terms of it's an unintended consequence, and I don't think it's very widely understood about cuts in 16 to 19 budgets in schools. I'm just talking about schools now with a sixth form. They, many schools are, are, are cross-subsidising their, their sixth form provision through their 11 to 16 funding. Mm. They are, you know, they're, they're, they're doing that. And they do it for very good reasons that they feel that they need or want to do it. Um, and we can argue about whether that's correct or not, but a lot of schools feel it's really important for them to have a sixth form. And if you squeeze the 16 to 19 part of the school funding, the obvious consequence is that you are taking more and more from 11 to 16. So it's not only 16 to 19 <coughs> students who are affected by squeezes to 16 to 19 funding, it's actually the rest of the kids in the school as well in terms of the money that's available for them. How, how, um, how, wide, how widely do you think that, um, that pushback um, because of just having to make do um, to keep your sixth form college, your sixth form provision? It is such a such a tricky uh, yes. uh, subject, and yeah. I think you know it, it's it's most schools most schools that have got a sixth form 
want to keep their sixth form. Mm -hmm. Some may not, but they're not going to go down on record as, as the head teacher who got rid of their sixth form. Yes. Whereas, and they do it for very valid reasons. Sometimes it attracts the right staff. Sometimes it, they think it can give the role models to younger people. Otherwise, some of the parents might not send their kids there in the first place. They send them to the schools that's got six forms. It, it, there's very valid reasons. And also, sometimes the staff in those institutions really need a broad perspective of teaching to teach from year seven through to, to the sixth form. How widespread it is, is it is an unknown, I think, in terms of what, to what extent places are being, so, or are cross-subsidising. And if you try to get to the bottom of it, and we work with our members to do that, it depends on the, the, which are the staffing salaries, or what, what, what level they're, they're teaching at, what level of, uh, um, are you a senior teacher or a junior teacher who's teaching in the sixth form? Is there spare capacity? What are the fixed costs in the institution? Uh, if, if you don't, if you close the sixth form, what do you do with all the teachers? Do you have to make them all redundant? Do they all leave? There's, it's, a, it's a bit of a minefield, and it's, uh, it's a very, very tricky area to begin to, um, begin to, to look in any depth at, I think. And I don't, I don't think that has been done on any kind of scale or, 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 or you know, and it's a political minefield, because quite rightly parents want choice, don't they? You would expect eventually to see that as um, reduced grades, wouldn't you, um, from... Reduced grades? Yes, from um, the, pup the pupils... Possibly, or possibly not. Of... Possibly not, because by its very nature, if you're talking about small school six forms, you're talking about small class sizes, probably, and you probably could argue they get more individual attention in that smaller class, mm -hmm. and they might actually do, right. do a bit better. Mm. Which, is, which lends more weight to don't close my nice small school sixth form and send them off to that big college where they, you know, that, that, that view also exists out there with a lot of parents as well. So yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say necessarily it would lead to smaller grades. No, it, it might in some cases, um, but not, not as a matter of course, no. Oh, thanks for that, because it, it, it would seem to follow. Thank you for that. Pardon? Sorry, Sorry, I was just going to chip in. Sorry to, to jump in. There is evidence that with very small school six forms, there is an impact on, on value added. They tend to have lower value added for very little students. Despite, as Kevin says, mm. the, the tendency for them to be more selective as well, they tend to add less value. Um, to be less or more? To add less value. Small six forms. Add adding less, less value. value to, on, on, for, for A-level results. Yeah. yeah, and what would be uh, the added value? What, what, um... Well, uh, value added is a measure of, of how students do against how they would be expected to do based on their prior achievement. So mm. added value of zero mm. means that you're doing as expected. So a positive um, uh, value can be added or you can, you can have negative added value. Mm. And we've got some evidence that um, six forms where there are less than 100 students mm. in, the, in the second year cohort mm. um, will tend to have lower, added, lower value added. I'm just going to add that we, one of the things that we did, it's a little bit old now, but I can share it with... Uh, with you speak up, please. Yeah, sorry, is um, we've looked at its size that actually matters. It's, le it's less about the type of institution, but there's a very clear relationship between the number of students in an institution, 16 to 19, and outcomes. Yeah. And as it gets lower, performance gets worse on the whole. So the problem that we have, so sixth form colleges on average have 2,000 students, School sixth forms on average have 200 students. So there's a very big difference there. But again, as Kevin and Eddie have said, one of the issues is in this kind of 16 to 19 market that we inhabit, there's, uh, there's a lot of talk about market entry, about new institutions joining. There's a lot less talk about market exit, certainly in the schools world. So in the FE world, we have mergers, we have a lot of flux, we have an FE commissioner who might come in and effectively close down or merge institutions. In the schools world, you can have school sixth forms that are performing very poorly, but there's no real mechanism to sort of remove them. So often the students are getting a poor deal, the results aren't <coughs> great, the overall school might be performing well. Mm -hmm. So there is something about how do we shine a light on the performance of the sixth forms in schools. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that excellent contribution. Uh, Lee. Um, so at Unison, we represent support staff. Um, they haven't been mentioned as yet. 
Uh, I noticed in the paper it was quite um, focused on the role of teachers, obviously very important in colleges, but about 50% of the staff in a college are the support staff. It's not just all about the teachers. Thank you. One of, one of the factors that affects the um, support staff, um, one of the factors that's going to affect them, the, the workload of teachers, is going to be the level of support staff that they've got, and they've been cut and cut to the bone, so it becomes a workload issue for everyone. It becomes a workload issue for the support staff that are the ones that still have their jobs because they now have a bigger job. And I speak to a lot that say their job description now doesn't represent in any way, shape or form the job that they're actually doing day to day. So that's a problem for them. Um, we do find that people, I mean, our members are certainly bearing the brunt of constant restructures. The mergers don't seem to have led to a nice, steady, stable model in which everything has improved and everyone knows what we're doing. We're seeing year after year after year, we have restructure after restructure. And that generally means that colleges are looking for cost savings and when they look for cost savings, they generally start making support staff redundant. That's what we're seeing happening. So they are bearing the brunt uh, there. Um, a way of saving money is that many staff are contracted out so the caterers, the cleaning staff, the security staff tend not to be directly employed by the college anymore but they're contracted out and this often means that they're on worse terms and conditions than everyone else in the uh, college, particularly with regards to pensions. So a lot of the reason that some colleges will take them out is just to save having to pay already the lowest paid members in the college uh, a, a decent pension when it comes to their retirement. We do have a fair few colleges in London that are paying the London living wage, which is good. However, what we don't have is people that are signed up as foundation living wage employers. Mm -hmm. They're too worried about their future finances to actually sign that and say, we'll always, yeah, we'll guarantee that you'll always have a decent wage in the future. So that's again, worrying for, worrying for staff. They're worried about their job security. They're worried about how much they're gonna get paid. They're worried about their retirement. It's not a great place for them to be in. And just staying with the support workers, Lee, are they more likely to be working part-time uh, or, or full-time? In a number of cases, yeah. Many are on um, term-time only contracts. Term-time uh, contracts. Yeah. Uh, many, the nature of the job means that it's part-time. So, for example, catering staff isn't a full-time job. So, mm. yeah, they will be sort of part-time staff. Mm. Uh, a lot across the board on zero hours contracts, which isn't something that we want to be encouraging either. Mm. Um, the, the Mayor is a great champion for the London living wage. Has your organisation had conversations with the Mayor in terms of this issue of getting educational providers signing up? Um, as far as I'm aware, I'd have to speak to my regional colleagues to be certain they haven't spoken directly to the mayor but in part of our national negotiations it is always part of our national negotiations to ask that all colleges sign up to become foundation living wage employees mm -hmm. but as i say very few actually even if they want to pay them that money very few mm -hmm. actually want to sign up to that initiative well that's something certainly we can raise uh, with, with the mayor um and then uh that that you've answered um your, your full answers uh, have been so useful that I can now go to just asking about variations um, from all that you've said. Um, do we see a wide variation between inner and outer London? Uh, anybody got anything to say about that? Or is it general? London is a, London is a very fluid um, mm -hmm region in terms of student movement and as, as Kevin said students are often traveling quite long distances mm -hmm. um, as part of yes. their their post 16 choices mm -hmm. it's I mean having, you know it needs to be said that the free bus pass is a is a fantastic um, um, foundation for, for student mobility although the tube although they don't have free tube travel they do have free bus travel mm -hmm. and there are many parts of the country that would be you know that would be delighted to have to have that, um, and in fact, the national um, discretionary bursary that the DfE uh, pays to colleges to, to 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 pay bursaries to students 
has to reflect the fact that other regions outside London don't, don't have free, free tra concessionary travel for, stu for students. So that is a great asset. Um, so I think there's a lot of movement across borough boundaries, a lot of movement across inner to outer London. The funding system is a national system, and uh, although there's, a, there's inner London waiting, it's actually not a bad system um, as a system. The, the problem is there's not enough money in it. Um, but the actual um, system which guarantees fairness um, is, 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 is not a bad system. Um, there are some inequities between schools and colleges. For example, the, uh, a few months ago, was it a year ago, when the teacher, the teacher, um, pay teacher pay grant was, 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 was awarded to um, academies and um, schools, but not to colleges. Colleges. So there are there are some inequities, but basically we have a national funding system. So there's not there's not um, a great deal of difference between inner and outer London. Yeah, thank you for that. Just, um, add, add Kevin? Just quite topically, I was talking to a member last week who works in an institution that borders Greenford and Ealing, and uh, um, Green, Greenford, Ealing, and Ryslip area. And, what, and the difficulty in getting staff to work in just this side of, of an arbitrary line, which is a borough, to get nearly £6,000 more money on the upper base mine, working in the sixth form there. And they're saying we just, so that school, 6000 more than the school, just you know, st almost a stone's throw, but a different borough. Yeah. That's, that's from the sixth form. So it is, a, it is an issue in terms of attracting staff. It can mm. be a very bit serious issue. Mm. I mean, th mm. This might come up later on. Eddie, Eddie touched upon it. But the changes to the, the reforms to the discretionary bursary mm. will have an impact disproportionately on London students. There's mm. no question. Mm. So the old regime mm. was based on the old EMA um, mm. payment. And it was very old and very out of date. So quite rightly, this bursary, the way that this bursary is calculated has been revised. Um, unfortunately, what it means for London, sixth form colleges in particular, is that they'll see quite a significant reduction in their bursary allocations uh, in future years. And that will have, an, obviously, then there's less money to provide to students that are in need of these bursaries. So at the moment, th there is a sort of cap on how much you can lose from next year. But that cap, yeah. obviously, is only in place for a few years. So that is money that colleges will have to find from other sources to um, to, to give to students. Because the, um, the, the same criteria applies, which is common to London, if you look yes. at po poverty indicators, personal needs or whatever. Yeah. But um, with a reduction in the fund, that's, that bursary um, still has to be given. Yes, quite. Right. It, it's because transport is is a factor, and in London, transport is is kind of a lot of it is taken care of by the concessionary bus pass. So that, in a sense, the GLA is is kind of shoring up that, mm -hmm. that cost. Mm -hmm. Whereas in other parts of the country, the DFE is having to to, to meet it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, thank goodness from my point of view, absolutely. Uh, because of the area that I represent. Um, and then lastly for me, for this section, is, um, you know, we hear about our students travelling further because, of course, they, they're using their choice, which is, which is right. Um, did somebody say this is unlike what's happening in the rest of the country, that students don't travel as far? I think in London you have more, you have more choice of providers within a travel to learn radius mm -hmm. than in most parts of the country. Maybe, maybe, I mean, it's possible that other urban areas like Birmingham or Manchester might have similar rates, but the, 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 the choices you have in terms of different kinds of provision greater within travel in distance are probably greater mm -hmm. um, in, in London. Um, and we've heard, you know, and travel in London is relatively easy and relatively cheap for, for students. So um, I think that's, that's right. The, the other point I just wanted to chip in on the um, uh, mergers. I wouldn't want people to assume that because we now have fewer colleges and larger colleges, that that necessarily means fewer campuses. Um, although the colleges may be rationalising and, um, you know, uh, making strategic decisions about where provision is, the number of campuses, the number of local campuses is being maintained. So you might have a large group, but you've still got campuses in every every key community that you serve. Mm -hmm. And colleges really value that, that relationship with their community and yeah. serving their community. The other thing is that students who travel 
Um, we know from the air reviews, actually, that the students who are the most willing to travel tend to be students who are at the higher level, so level three, A-level students, etc., are prepared to travel further. Mm -hmm. And it's important that colleges recognize that at entry level, level one, students need provision nearer to where they live to get their foot on the ladder and not have you know, the obstacle of, 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 of challenging travel. As you, as you become more confident and more successful, in a sense, you are more likely to be prepared to travel further to get to the college you want or do the course you want to do and in the college you want to go to. I can just add into that Thank point. Thank you. Yes, Lee. Uh, colleges do have a disproportionate amount of students with special needs and they do have a disproportionate number of students who come from deprived communities. So that last point that my colleague made would affect colleges more than it would affect <coughs> other areas of education because they're not going to be as willing as some other students would be to travel those further distances. Lee, you've just done a, a wonderful segue, I think they call it, into the next section where I'm going to hand over to my colleague um, who's going to pick up the issue of SEN, SEND pupils. Okay, but I will say before I start that um, the one thing I was really pleased to hear is one of you said that the quality of provision is good, so I'm pleased to hear that. Um, this is mainly to Phil and then anybody else if they've got any other comment. How has the increase in SEND pupil numbers impacted on funding pressures? Well, I think it's a really important question. I was just going to going to echo the points from my, my colleagues a second ago, which is about uh, the young people with SEND, and we know um, with the change from uh, LDA across to young people with education, health, and care plans that that follows through with them uh, through to the age of 25, um, and their requirements are, need to be met, and their goals, you know, their life goals and experiences need to be. Uh, targets for those young people uh, and we know that there's more of those being identified in the system now uh, and they're following those young people through into their post-16 journey and because those young people as, as has also been pointed out a lot of those young people are studying at the lower levels uh, then they need to be able to access that provision kind of locally in their community there's quite a big drive for uh, inclusive education and that, that's helping keep young people in their local community uh, part of that and part of able to study in those places and, and clearly that adds some considerable pressure into the system and I think it hasn't it hasn't been accounted for that, that you know in terms of the, the, the costs and, uh, that that is bringing to bear on the on the post-16 system and we know that the projections are that we're going to be seeing more of those young people coming through and that's going to just be increasing uh, those costs uh, that, that my colleagues here have already referred to so I think it's a, it's a super important point to to bring up, it's a super important point to be aware of and to think about um, formulating some kind of policies and some responses to, to local government that we can say sim simply that we need more money to help support these young people is a really important thing to say. Anybody else on that particular point? I was just going to say, there's a, sorry, there's a distinction between students with kind of SEN and those with kind of really high needs. Um, what we have definitely seen is an increase in students with with SEN, there's no question, and they have to be dealt with in the kind of the reduced funding unit of resource that we, we have. But where it gets really problematic is for students that have needs of over £6,000 per year when you then start to have to engage with local authorities. And frankly, this system is completely broken because as colleges in particular, you, you, you have essentially one group of impoverished institutions chasing another group of impoverished institutions for, for funding. And it, and it just isn't working. So um, very often a sixth form college will have to pay itself because it can't get the money from the local authority to fund you know, these students. And these students can have really high needs, be very complex and very expensive. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's a cap, I mean, colleges already are in poor financial health as we've already discussed. So there are big implications for cash flow. It's bad for the students and it's stressful for them. So there is something, if you're at a typical sixth form college, even in London, might be dealing with 10, 15 uh, uh, boroughs, different, all working in different ways, all using different systems, um, some more inclined to, to find the funding the, than, than others, some more able to find the, the funding than others. So when we get to the kind of solution side of this later on, there is something about a sort of pan-London single approach to dealing with these high needs students because at the moment this is a very kind of stressful uh, system that's not working particularly well at all. Okay, going back to something I think it was you Eddie that said earlier that budgets are not being spent how they should be. 
I was referring to the global um, expenditure on, I mean, there's you know, 850 million pounds being spent by government on 16 to 18 education in London as a whole. And I think because of the inefficiencies in the system, that could be spent better. I think that was my point. I wasn't referring to SEND particularly, but I mean, James is absolutely right on the, on the SEND issue. We've got um, a growth in, in demand for um, uh, SEND students. There's probably 30,000 students with identified needs across the system. We've also got, um, in the high needs category, we've got this, I think it's a crazy system, isn't it? This, this, this crazy system where each college has to have a bilateral conversation with each local authority for each high needs learner, and there has to be an EHCP in place. And inevitably, those, there isn't any common approach. Some local authorities, I think, have tried to get together to have a common approach. There's examples outside London of local authorities grouping themselves together and having a, having a common protocols or pooling their funding and saying let's have a let's let's mm. give colleges some security of funding and some 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 um, you know common pr processes. And I think maybe this is an area where the GLA, although it has no powers in this area, could use its kind of convening power to knock heads together a bit, mm. because um, what's happening is colleges are often out of pocket, both with the six thousand pound plus HNS students who, um, you know, the money doesn't, doesn't you, you, you provide the support, but the money doesn't come, um, but also with the, with the thousands of, of, of young people who are, who are not, they haven't slipped into the, post, the, the um, over 6,000 pounds category, but their needs are, are, quite, are still quite, quite expensive to meet. Um, and the college sector is a very inclusive sector, and, you know, you, we're not turning people away, and um, you're enrolling students who have, who have needs from day one, and they have to be met from day one. Just on that, on that point that Eddie's made, which is, which is super important there, that's, that's actually one of the recommendations from our post-16 SEND review, is to, is to have a, a better sort of set of processes that can be more sort of communal across local authorities, have a better understanding of what their colleges are actually asking for, so that those processes can be more common, can look more, more alike to each other, and therefore the, you know, the complexity of having to interact with N different local authorities is hopefully reduced in some way, and that is a thing that um, that we put in that in that re re review, which is a recommendation to the, the um, for GLA as well. So I think that is a that is an area of, of policy that certainly you know, the GLA can get involved with. Okay. Thank you. But I think that's such an important point because the issue here is London, and certainly at national councils that we have across the country, there is a view amongst our members, who are generally head teachers and college principals, that the larger the um, authority that you are in, the more chance there is of students with SEND not receiving the help, whether at all or in time because of the administration and the bureaucracy. If you, it's very simple. If you're in, a, if you're in a, um, a particular area where there's probably only one college or a, a small number, it's very easy to transfer the paperwork and you meet the students and you interview them and you see their parents, etc. And it's relatively seamless. When you've got the, the more boundaries and boroughs that students cross, the more chance there is. So there is an argument that it that London could therefore be perceived as the uh, least performing in <coughs> that way in the whole country, which is, I'll throw it out there, mm. which is not what we want. <laughs> you say it's perceived to be, is that the fact, or is it just perceived to be? Yeah, I'm just I think it's hard, it's, it's hard to be kind of definitive about it, but certainly my experience from our members, which is similar to Kevin's, is yeah, we have more feedback, negative feedback from London colleges than any other part. We've got eight different regions. If you're, if you're in Hampshire, and you're dealing with Ham Hampshire County Council, we've got a lot of colleges in Hampshire. Well, that's quite an easy conversation because you're dealing mm. with the person that leads on this at Hampshire County Council. London is a different kettle of fish just yes, by of of how big it is. So certainly the feedback we get from members mm. about London is, is absolutely, I would endorse what Kevin says, yeah. Okay, I mean, how are FE providers balancing the need for investment in mainstream and send streams? Anybody? It just adds to the, the daily challenge of, 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 of balancing the books because as I said earlier needs need student need needs to be met um, and they're presenting from day one um, and so you have as a large if you're a large college you do have an infrastructure to meet those needs so you will have specialist support and specialist services so you're more likely to be able to meet those needs but it is a constant it's a constant pressure and it's a 
it's often a difficult judgment um, if you want to be investing in a new curriculum area or you know creating new courses um, but at the same time you're you you you, you know that you you also you also have to support many hundreds of students <coughs> who have quite quite um, expensive needs if you like to meet okay, so how would you judge that this is impacting the actual learners well I would say it adds to the it adds to the pressure that we talked about earlier it, it, it inevitably it's going to have an impact on course hours and the wider student experience um, for all students it's bound to one of the problems we'll have today with with all this is a, a kind of a hardy perennial on when we talk about 16 to 19 education whether it's mainstream students or those of finance or whatever is the way um, it's called comparable outcomes works in terms of the performance tables and basically what that means is is that broadly a, a similar cohort will perform in the same way year on year. So what that means when we talk about impact in terms of exam results, that isn't really going to change over time, almost irrespective of what happens with funding and these other pressures. So when we're talking about indicators and impact and how have things changed, unfortunately exam results is not a good indicator because that methodology is used in, in performance tables. And it is important to recognise that the performance tables are relatively strongly focused on level three outcomes. Um, and level three outcomes would, would be what we would see in, in schools and, you know, sixth form colleges and colleges. Um, but as, as Eddie said, you know, a lot of the young people, particularly with the SEND needs, are going to be studying at lower levels. Um, and, and as we speak in London, we, t we talk about having more schools with sixth forms. They're not necessarily all small, although I, I take it the point that quite a lot of them are. Um, a school with a smallish sick form is more likely to be offering a level three program that looks like A-levels, um, sort of traditional A-level study. Um, and that isn't going to be the sort of thing that is entirely suitable to, to a big part of the cohort, right? And not, not just young people with SEND needs. Um, and so it's important to recognise where the roles of, of other providers picking up those students, how they can do that. But then the you know, the, the problem out of the other side of that is that the measures that exist in the performance tables at the moment and the things that uh, the sector, the 16 to 18 sector as a whole is judged upon is largely geared towards the level three outcomes. So they're not necessarily, there isn't necessarily the recognition that exists in the system for the, for the work that the, mm -hmm. those type of organisations are doing with the people at the lower levels. Mm -hmm. And that is changing a little bit over time, but, it, but, but there is a, a very traditional view of, the, of outcomes at, at the end of Key Stage 5, at the end of 18, which is uh, you know, average points that you scored in your A-levels. Um, and I think that's a, that's a challenge for these sorts of institutions because it's very hard for them to really strongly evidence the impact that they've actually had on those young people. Is there a simple way of actually measuring that? <laughs> uh, progress over time, yeah, <laughs> or other outcomes. Um, but but to, one, one problem is that, that it's a little bit technical, but that quite a lot of the measures that are used don't even include the young people who aren't part of that cohort. So they're actually just discounted before the measures are taken. So even expanding some of those measures to simply include that bit of the cohort would shine a light on on the fact that those young people exist because to some extent the measures at the moment aren't really recognizing that they exist mm. so have you lobbied anybody ab about this me personally we have, we, we, we have we certainly have yes i mean the, uh, phil's absolutely right the measures are skewed in terms of the students for whom the system works well already um, and actually what the fe sector is doing is it's doing the heavy lifting that we need to do as a city and as a country if we're really going to make an impact on the skills, you know, skills, productivity, all the other economic agendas, mm -hmm. because it's the it's the students who are furthest away from from level three um, that need the most work, and that work is being done. And as you say, it's not being recognised. Um, it's difficult. It's difficult to recognise. There are, you know, it's possible to recognise it, but yeah. the current um, performance measures don't really do that. Okay, Lee. I could just take you away from the data and onto the actual sort of experience day to day that sh students with SEND and uh, people that help them have. We've got the fact that it's already been mentioned that many um, support staff have lost their jobs, so we've got fewer support staff supporting more students coming into the system. But also, when we ask about what training um, learning support assistants receive, they say very little, very little job specific training. They might get the statutory ones like safeguarding, prevent and things like that, but they're not getting the amount of training that they would want in order to be able to support staff with ever, uh, students, sorry, with ever more complex needs that are coming into the system. 
Another resource factor that we found is where hours have been cut, where everyone's so much busier, they've got bigger class sizes, LSAs are not getting the opportunity to jointly plan with teachers how they're going to meet the students' needs, which is how an effectively deployed system of learning support assistance should be working. And they just, you know, a lot of them will try and they'll fit it in in 10 minutes at the end of the day and stuff like that, but it's impossible for them to be able to do that to the level that they want to do. Okay. Um, the educational panel has previously recommended that the mayor improve the evidence base around SEND, for instance, around demand projections for the HCPs. How much investment and expertise would it take to build up information and intelligence around this area in FE? I think the point Eddie made about uh, most schools and colleges, school sixth forms of colleges that have students who've got SEND, whether it's up to the 6,000 or CHCPs with very detailed care <coughs> plans, have a member of staff or have one person or have somebody who deals with that or who deals with lots of different London local authorities about these issues. One would imagine that it's not beyond the remit of a, of a group to be able to try and coordinate the views of those of those individuals and institutions, but I, I'm not sure it's something that uh, um, has has been tried. It wasn't tried when, in my experience as a London principal. I don't know. If it, we we just you know we found every day some local authorities were really good at dealing with, and some were terrible, and some you felt were trying to obfuscate, and some were trying to not send you to their their specialist college that they may be that they may be uh, providing in different parts of the country which is outside London because some some were you knew that local authority would be very quick to go to court to defend a particular issue and others wouldn't it's it's very disparate practice uh, I'm not sure I'm answering your question but it, it's very disparate practice but the the knowledge is probably out there within the, the sector okay. if we could right. garnish it somehow I'm not sure it's research, actually. I'm not sure it's, uh, bless you. I'm not sure it's research or projections necessarily either. I think if there was something, I mean, we touched upon it earlier on, help with the process. If you were to, I think if you were to ask sixth form colleges, what could the mayor do? What could, you know, what would, what was the single thing that could help us now? It would be to improve the process, particularly with students with high needs, in terms of getting money from the 15, 20 different sort of mm. authorities that they could be talking to. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of, it's very, very hand to mouth at the minute and as I say it does have an impact on cash flow and the wider college finances so that I think would be I think where the priority area for help would be. Yes I, I agree I th I'm, I'm not sure it's more research we I think the evidence of the need is there mm -hmm. the evidence of what it costs to meet the need is there we need a simplification of processes but also you know we do need to sweep away some of the some of the bureaucracy of this and get back to the needs of the students what why is it that the most vulnerable, the most disadvantaged, the most needy students and their families have the greatest struggle to actually get what, what they're entitled to, to get access to, to, to the same education opportunities as everyone else. That's, that's the real question and, and simply the unit of resor the, the, the resources aren't, aren't there and too often we're rationing and we're, we're having to you know, paper chase. The trouble is bureaucracy gets in the way of so many things and costs so Sometimes many Sometimes it is that, yes. Yeah. Are you taking over the next? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank yeah. you. Um, oh, thank you for that. Um, just um, finishing the, the um, really important area to do with SEND um, young Londoners. Um, the Public Accounts Committee um, launched, made announcements that they're going to do one of their in-depth inquiry on send send provision you see what did they say it's send provision and funding isn't it um and then the general elections called but we do know from contacts um within that department that they will be um picking this up once they reconvene post the general election just wondering did your organizations feed in to pack yeah yeah, that's great. Uh, we certainly made a submission based on the inquiry that we had, um, we had that we've done earlier, based on the work we've done earlier. So it's a pretty powerful committee. So um, let's see if, um, if they can sort of identify this issue as well 
especially uh, around um, the whole bureaucracy, mm. you know, of it all. No, sorry, Chair, our, our submission does highlight that um, the notion of regional partnerships, standardisation of paperwork and procedures. There's also the issue, we haven't, I don't think we've said much about this issue of transfer of information from school to college. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's a need to review that process because there's sometimes a reluctance for sometimes very, you know, understandable reasons to pass on certain kinds of information mm -hmm. from school to college. Mm -hmm. And um, that also can, can get in the way of meeting needs, you know, in a timely way and in an effective way. And yeah. it also affects, um, it also has an impact on behaviour issues, and I'm not sure if we're going to get onto the issue of, of violent crime and the, 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 the safety of students, of young people in, in, in London, but there's that issue about passing on information which um, a school might regard as being compromising, but which actually is incredibly useful and important to help a student, not, and, and not in any way disadvantage them, but to actually help them. Uh, around behaviour and and, and mm. behaviour issues, so which you would get if the if the pupil is come in with their assessment complete. If it's part of an EHCP, yes. But, yes, but but some the majority will come in don't have EHCP with, yeah. without that yeah. assessment. Uh, thanks for that point. We'll we'll look at that. Okay, let's just look uh, briefly at the area review. And I know we've said um, that it's too early yet, and indeed. Um, this is the committee charged to follow up on that review and the mayor's relationship with commissioning the services. Um, but are, have you heard or are, has, has anything really stood out so far from, from your point of view? I, I, was, um, I was on the Pan London, I was on the East London Area Review and I was also on the Pan London Area Review representing uh, colleges and... Um, as I said, I referred earlier to the, uh, the, I called it unfinished business. I mean, there was a mass of data collected by GLA um, staff and DFE, provided by DFE and the colleges themselves, around the, the pattern of 16 to 18 provision in London. Um, and I suppose, at the risk of repeating myself from my, my earlier point, um, colleges have used that um, in many ways to rationalise provision, to to, to think strategically about the needs of their, of their area. <coughs> the unfinished business is the school sector. Now, you could get you know, around 30 people in this room and you'd have all the principals of all the colleges in London in a room. You could actually you know, have a conversation around, around a post-16 strategy, but you'd be missing uh, over half of the, of the 16 to 18 provision. The, the problem with that conversation is you probably need you know, 300 pe 400 people in the, in the room. So it's clearly more difficult. But I don't mm. think that means it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be tried. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the unfinished business of the area review. And the data's there, the analysis is there. If anything, the problem's got worse. We've got more small school six forms in London than we had a few years ago. Um, you know, I, someone has to get a grip on it, um, and it's, I, my guess is it's got to be some combination of the GLA and the London boroughs, and and government. You know, com, whether it's a commissioner, it's not helped by the fact that we've got four four different schools commissioners in London, yes. and none of whom commission FE. We have a separate FE commissioner, so but there is there is a, a it does feel like there's a need for for someone to take a hold of this issue and start thinking about cooperation, collaboration, partnership, um, because a great city like London. Um, deserves better, I think. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. I think the, the important point there about having those extra school sick forms, you know, we know that uh, government policy in the form of academisation is, is to some extent encouraging that, and that is an important thing to sort of be aware of and, and, and actually to, to help mitigate some of those things, as you say, is, is that we need to understand that not everyone is going to be going down those, those level three routes. And, and again, the government policy on the measurement is... is focusing somewhat on level three, but also government policy around um, what qualifications are being pushed forward, things like the emergence of T levels, that's a, that's a level three qualification again, so it's not helping with the idea that, that there is demand from, the, from entry level, level one and level two students that is not really being kind of recognised, and, and it's almost like that it, it's being forgotten about to some extent there by both the process and by also some of the, the, the policy that's coming forward on that side. Not good. Not good. Um, okay, so we've got. Uh, in, we will return to that in the new year when we speak to the deputy mayor responsible for that area. 
Um, the, uh, we, we, when we were doing this work earlier this year or late last year, we heard that there were still outstanding challenges for some areas and colleges. Uh, uh, comes to mind Lewisham, and there were some colleges that were not settled. Uh, have all the colleges now got themselves in into locations or into partnerships? <laughs> oh, that's a that's a that's a big question. I, I mean, I, I I think we live in a in a context where you probably can't ever say that everything's ever settled. Right. Um, colleges are looking to find conf configurations which work uh, so that they can be viable um, uh, financially, um, and but also to relate to their communities. In many cases, with the larger groups, you're going to be talking about several communities serving different communities and different needs. Um, and also your relationship with other colleges, with universities, with schools, with employers, getting all of that right. Mm. And I don't think there is a, a, bl a perfect blueprint for London or for Lewisham or for any other part, you know, part, part of London, which um, you could say, oh, that's the right model. Um, and um, the quality of leadership is good, um, but the challenges that those leaders are facing in, in balancing the books and, and meeting the need um, whether it's adults or young people, are, are, are enormous, and the pressures are enormous. So it's not surprising if, you know, people are asking, leaders are asking themselves, and communities are asking themselves, have we got it right here, have we got it right there? And there are some interesting mergers. There's FEHE mergers, there's FEFE mergers, there's 6-1 College FE mergers, and there's all sorts of different kinds of mergers. And they're all experiments, um, and they're all based on some logic and some, some, some reason, reasoning but they're all having to operate in a very, very difficult climate, a very difficult context. So I, I don't think I'm answering the question, but I'm just you, laying out the laying no, out the, you're, you're, the, this context of this problematic context we're all in. <laughs> no, it's great because you're just illustrating how complex the whole thing is. And, uh, and it's an area that, you know, uh, I don't think the complexity of it is realized. It, it just seems that um, I suppose it's, it's, you have to be involved in it, or have a to be a student, or to be a parent, uh, to be interested in it. Um, I don't know. Um, pe people tend to think it's it's quite a simple thing. Uh, but the, exper the experience of learners and parents and so on often is their local campus, their local college. Yes. And in a sense, whether it's part of a giant group or whether it's a small college, whether it's you know w w how, w how it fits into the bigger picture is less important than yes. the staff, yeah. the experience, the warmth, the welcoming nature of the, of, the, of the place, the safety of the place, but also is it running the courses you want? You know, that, that's the key yeah. relationship, and everyone is trying to protect that yeah. um, in, in these difficult circumstances. But whether it's Lewisham or nationally, I think tying your point about the area review and merges together, fundamentally, the flaw in the area review was to look at, was to exclude 40% so in of yeah, the so providers. It, and in London, it, it's the other way around. There's actually more students and schools than there are in colleges. Unusually, that's different across the rest of the country. So if you're at least ex excluding, excluding at least 50% of the stock, if you like, what would make more sense is to look at Lewisham or Havering or wherever it is and say, what does provision look like for all young people and be driven by young people, not by the, uh, the legal definition of the institution they happen to uh, be educated at, looking at that in the round would make the, a great deal more sense. Um, I have to say, we're not massive fans of mergers on the whole, because what tends to happen with a sixth form college is that they get merged with a bigger FE college. However, we have seen, seen Havering sixth form college is a really good example that's entered into a merger from a position of strength rather than weakness. Mm -hmm. And when you look at their plan, it makes complete sense. But overall, you're limiting the options. In some cases, it would, be make, it would make more sense to merge three or four school sixth forms, mm. put them together with a sixth form college. But the way that the model works, and this comes from the top down, this is a national issue, is that there's silo working, colleges over here, schools over there, and the best fit solution often crosses the two. Mm, yeah. And so, um, uh, what's the latest on the uh, Croydon College and Colston sixth form college merger? Is that happened? It, yeah, and um, again, I think that's a good 
uh, that, that's a good example. And I think that, that, that if you like, the ingredients of an effective merger from a sixth form college perspective is that the sixth form college is allowed to keep its own identity. Mm -hmm. So it was Eddie's point earlier on, the learners in, the, in that area, um, to the outside world, there's no real difference. Mm -hmm. They have a, a, a kind of principle or a centre head. They have its identity. It's still known as the sixth form college. I think the mergers that don't work are where sixth form colleges are kind of swallowed up by a very, very large FE college and that identity is lost. So I think that overall, that, that's how we would say a good merger works. Yeah. Oh, well, it's good to hear good news. And there's, then, another side. there's another side to the merger thing. I so, think sorry, Phil, we can't, I can't hear you. Sorry, there's another side to the merger question as well, which is around uh, the, sort of the parental choice understanding of the situation. So obviously when things are merged, then their data tends to get reported at the, at the merged level, which, can, which, which sort of hides the, the individuality that, that my colleagues here are referring to about the campuses. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the thing that we're sort of losing at the moment is the visibility of the campuses. We know they exist. Eddie said that they, they still exist. But, you know, your South Thames College or wherever, that doesn't really exist anymore. It's kind of a, a selection of different campuses. Mm -hmm. But for the, for the local community that are being served by a particular campus, it's harder for them to, to find out, you know, the, the data side of what that campus is doing at the moment, you know, what they offer, how they appear, even in those, you know, slightly flawed measures that we, we spoke about earlier. It's kind of getting a little bit obfuscated by, by those mergers which are happening as a, you know, as a necessity, as my colleagues have said. That's absolutely right. And we, we, we have a, there's a dialogue with, the, with Ofsted as well around uh, campus level inspections, because as you move to larger groups, um, it makes less and less sense to have a grade for you know, a, a large group that has multiple campuses. And you can lose some of the granular detail about the quality of what's going on in different campuses. So, and if you look at the performance tables for London now, you'll see you want to, you know, there's, there's now, very soon we'll have fewer colleges in London than there are London boroughs. So already you have London boroughs where if you look at the post-16 tables, um, one of the main providers for young people in that borough actually doesn't appear in the borough data. You, know, mm. you have to look at in another borough because that's where the headquarters of the, the college is. So, so that mm. but that, <coughs> bit, it, it seems to be lost, but yes, we the, know it's not. The, the quality is still there underneath, but you, to, it's not visible. It's not yeah. as visible as, as, as Phil yeah, says. But that's counterintuitive because originally it was you, uh, Eddie, who said as far as students are concerned, they have no knowledge of borough boundaries. It yes. doesn't matter to them. Yes. So, so the, it's data the quality is not of provision which counts. It isn't important that every borough should have its own college, yeah. is it? That's right. So the, the data is out of sync with the reality on the ground. I think the, the way it's presented um, and, and, and the performance, the point of the performance tables is for the public, isn't it? It's for parents and, and students to, 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 make, uh, to, to be informed. Um, that doesn't reflect the reality on the ground. I think that's, that's my point. Oh, right, thank you. Well, um, it was just some other questions about the, the funding formula, but I don't think we're in a position to hear much about that because London has yet to have confirmed details of the 16 to 19 funding allocation. Is that still the case? No, we, we, we have a pretty stable funding... F I think I was talking about it earlier. That we have a fairly stable funding formula, which is you know, tweaked every year a little bit, okay. but we're, as a sector, the, the 16 to 18 sector is, is um, quite used to the idea of a national funding formula, um, and it's administered by the ESFA, and we're not expecting big changes. The, okay. the main objection we, we all have, I think, is that it's not, it's not funded well enough, right. uh, but as a system, it's, it's quite a good system for, for guaranteeing equity across the country. Um, and it does reflect inner city, you know, in, in, inner London costs and so on. So, um, when I don't think we're waiting for some. Well, I think big colleges, change. colleges that will be and um, schools will be clear about the funding that they will get next year. Um, I think what's uh, less clear are the uh, implications of the recent spending round announcement, um, and they are in the process of kind of shaking out. Um, but, but even on that, at a headline level, we could say that the base rate of funding, as Eddie said, which, which has been pegged at £4,000 since 2013, we know that next year it will go up to 4188 So clearly that's not uh, anywhere close to what we need. And again, on the campaign, the Razor 8 campaign, we're saying we need at least £760 per student extra on the base rate, but it's a good start. Um, and what we're in the process literally 
today of looking at is the, there was an additional 120 million pound for certain subjects and seeing what the implications are for that funding. And we've lobbied quite hard for that to be applied to A-level and, and BTEC subjects as well. So, I mean, actually, when we, when we find out what next year looks like, we think it's going to be certainly better than previous years, but again, not what we collectively need. And I think the big priority is to influence the spending review that's taking place next year to make sure that the funding rate in particular increases to where it needs to be. Can I, can I echo that on behalf of our, our organisation? The 16 to 19 funding formula, I think people who've been in the game a long time think it's the best formula that there has been in most professionals from that sector's kind of experience. It works well, it's understood by those who need to understand it. It's, it's relatively fair, it is the quantum that's wrong. And I would suggest that it's probably one of the um, most secure formula, method, 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 uh, sort of methodological ways of calculating something. It's the most robust, probably, out of all of the um, nursery, um, pre-16, national, the new national funding formula, pre-16, uh, AEB, what's happening with the AEB, uh, what's happening with all the other areas of, of funding. I think the 16 to 19 probably stands as the one that shouldn't be touched. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the sector's view on that. Thank you. One, one thing which came out of some work we were looking, doing looking at post-16 trajectories recently uh, is the possibility that, that the funding for 18-year-olds was sort of considerably less than the 16 and 17-year-olds. I'm not the best person to speak about this, but I wonder if colleagues might, might I mean, refer to that. As, it, that's worth, worth pausing on for a moment. I think the, the cut which was made a few years ago um, to the funding for 18-year-olds, in other words, young people who happen to, to be 18, <laughs> Um, of 17.5%, wasn't it? 17.5% is still in place in the formula. And I think that there's a very strong case for saying these are learners who are doing absolutely everything right. You know, mm. They started from a lower base when they left school. They're staying in the system for longer, mm. full time. Um, they're, they're working their way up the, the ladder of progression. You know, they're, they're, they're aiming to, to achieve. Um, and uh, suddenly their institution, the students don't experience this, but the, the, the institution, because they turn 18, then loses 17.5% of their funding. And there's no way you can deliver that. There's no way you can target those students and give them slightly fewer, fewer hours of teaching. Or You, know, it, it, you can't do anything about that cut in, in, in the college, uh, except it's a, it's a, it affects your, whole, your, your budget. It, it, if you have lots of these students, it affects your budget. So that would be a restoration you know, because it's um, it's a penalty for for being ambitious, really, for being for, for, for starting from a low base and, mm. and wanting to keep keep going until you until you make continue it the job. and continue the job. Yes. So yeah. it's um, that's one cut that it was a particularly pernicious cut, I think, at the time, and um, and not really justified. Um, and I think that yeah. that could be restored. That would be a very welcome um, and, and change. It has been recognised, hasn't it, in the new qualification T levels will get the full funding. Yeah for 18 year olds so it's recognized that there's that this, oh, right. is, this is an issue so you will get it if a student is doing so if you're levels. 18 and you're doing level three t levels t levels, t -levels you'll get the you'll full get it, funding rate but level one and two no no, no if but if you doing, wouldn't be 18 at level one and no two. you wouldn't be doing yeah. that but if you're doing a levels or applied general qualifications yeah. or anything else at the age of uh, 18 you what you'll get 82 and a half percent yeah t levels you get 100 percent. you get 100 percent. okay uh, so everybody's got to go to the t levels clearly um, so, just um, uh, one more question. Um, the, de the delegated adult education budget, isn't that an opportunity that this cut can pick up for the 18-year-old? The AEB budget is a whole debate on its oh, own. Yeah, no, we're the, we're the committee that monitors it, and but, I don't yeah, want to, but it's to over, get into it's, that. It's very it, over-committed. Uh, the basic entitlements for adults kind of more than account, it's, it's more than accounted for by those basic entitlement, entitlements for adults. And it does pick up some full-time learners over 19 um, who are cont young continuers, but it's a, different, it's a different cohort than the cohort we're talking about. Okay. No, and we'll, we, we do that next year. And what we'll do, if we can, we'll write to you 
um, for any thoughts that you have from your perspective and from your organisation when we do that work. So I'll pass over now um, to uh, my colleague, uh, Fiona. Thank you. Um, some of the areas I think have already been covered. It's been mm. quite an extensive um, discussion. Mm. Um, but I was going to talk about quality provision and around uh, funding cuts as well. Uh, given the funding cuts since 2010, um, I wondered whether you could comment on whether there's been any effect on the quality of 16 to 19 education and the outcomes. Um, and I'm happy to start with whoever wants to pick them up first. Kevin, you look like you. Okay, I'm very say. happy to. It, it's actually a point that I think has been made by both James and mm. Eddie. And, it, and in terms, if you try to measure the quality of outcomes, you can do it subjectively and you can do it objectively. If you do it objectively, you are using uh, performance table mm. data. And pretty much, if you take what we the simplest measure, maybe A-level pass rate, yeah. it hasn't changed really yeah. in the last 10 years. And it never will. It is impossible within the built-in constraints of the system for it to change. The, the point earlier about added value though, has that changed? Well, added value is, is a measurement of saying what grades does yeah, a student no, start yeah. with and what grades yeah. do they finish with. Has that changed? Uh, again, it's always around a zero. So an equal number of students will be below as above the line. So I think it's difficult to say if value has improved or not in that respect. What you could measure against, for example, in terms of that objective measure, is to look at uh, the destinations of young people, mm -hmm. and that includes young people in London, and for example, what type of universities they may go to. And uh, since the funding cuts of 2010, there's almost a direct um, divergence of the students from independent sector who are going to the top universities and students from the state sector since 2010. That gap is going steadily going like that. And the argument, the argument one could put forward is that the top universities are looking at the quality of outcomes in terms of how they interview young people, right. in terms of the other experiences that the young person is coming with, and that is why they are choosing the, state, the independent sector. That, that's one thought on that. Kevin's, Kevin's point is really important there, and that gap has got wider. I think it's 22% of state sector students go to the most selective universities and 61 from the independent sector. But I'm afraid a lot of these roads do lead back to funding. So um, the, the total amount of funding that a student in the state sector gets on average for the sixth form is £500 less than it costs for a, an independent school student for an entire year. So the term we get, they get more in a term in the independent sector than a state student gets for an entire year. So there's a, there's a big gap in terms of social mobility, that, and that's something that you can, you can see. So what, what's, that, um, what's that attributable to? Because obviously when um, young people apply to university, they have to demonstrate quite broad extracurricular exactly activity exactly now as well. So is it mainly that those funding cuts haven't actually um, necessarily affected the grades? but they've affected what people can put yeah, on. That, that's yeah. exactly what yes. it is. If you, if yes. you look at the experience, it's the experience. Mm. The experience now is a part-time experience. Right. The yeah. 15 hours that we're getting in this country compared to 25, 30 in Shanghai and Singapore and places like that. But the hallmark of the independent school experience is the extracurricular. Yeah. It is these wider things. It's the visits. It's the help of applications. It's all of these things. And since 2010, what has happened is that the offer is na it's reduced and it's also narrowed. So what you end up with is a sort of bargain basement, part-time experience, three subjects, a little bit of tutorial, and honestly, not a, not a great deal more. So when a young person from the state sector is up against a young person from the independent sector, that could be in terms of progression to HE, it could be in terms of a job interview as well. Mm -hmm that's where they are majorly disadvantaged. So is the, is the only solution to that increased funding or are there other ways that people are managing to achieve that? So is, is that uniform across the board, that this is a picture across the board, or the some institutions that are managing to buck that trend, and if so, how are they doing that? I think there is something about, we do get to the point since 2010, I'm talking about sixth form colleges mm -hmm. here, we are now, and always were, but even now more so, seriously lean 
institutions. Yeah. We've got some members with 4,000 students and a senior leadership team of three. So in terms of, you go through a period, I think, where there is a bit of fat, you can, you can box and cox, you can try and reduce things here, but you then get to the point where, frankly, you're kind of running on fumes. And I think that's where we are as a sector. Um, so I, I do think that the fundamental thing that needs to change is the funding needs to change. And within that, it's the base rate of funding that needs to change. And we need to try and get the government away from targeting funding at particular mm. subjects or qualifications and say just the core funding is insufficient. Okay. Thank so, you. and uh, sorry, um, yes, would you like I'll to... i say it goes to the heart of... Uh, I, I think this question goes to the heart of what, what do we want from 16 to 18 education in this country. When we have visitors from abroad, from France or Germany or the, or the States, and we say to them, you know, our 16 to 18 year olds are getting 15, 15 hours of contact time maximum. Um, and there are enrichment opportunities, but they are very limited. Um, they, are, they are shocked, you know, and they, they see it as a kind of a neglect of, our, of, of mm. that generation. Of, you know, we're, we're not investing in that generation. So as a sector, I think we've done very well to protect the kind of um, achievement, the exam achievement of our students. And I think pound for point, we do better than the independent sector. You know, we're getting more, more points, more A-level points per pound spent than, than, than the independent sector. But what they provide um, is that is that round that all round experience, which is um, it's, it's not a, they're not these are not frills they're not you know no. they're not luxuries they're, enrichment is almost the wrong word what what they're doing is they're they're, they're developing those young people um, and they're preparing them for you know the the, the, the the next challenge. And is there a difference in that sort of um, ultimate outcome so, so the sort of destination of the students is there a difference between London and the UK on that? Better London is better. London's done better. Yeah, progression to HE in, in London is, um, is consistently higher um, than um, uh, the rest but of the country. And the particularly but for the change over time where you've got um, that sort of increasing divergence between independent sector No, I think that's to do with where they go. But in terms of progression to HE, uh, progression in London, um, and including a free school meal student, disadvantaged students, is very, very high. It's the highest in the country. In fact, I think we're the only capital city in the world where education achievement is higher in, in the capital city than in the rest of the country. And is that because of the London challenge, or is that because of other factors? Uh, okay. okay. There's just one other Maybe thing. lots of reasons. <laughs> yeah. Just one other thing to take it back a little step from, from what my colleagues have been saying as well, but the, the experience of young people through Key Stage 4 is, is relevant here as well, as government policy has moved away from a, a breadth of subjects at Key Stage 4 and moved move focus more on uh, like English baccalaureate style achievements, you know, in Attainment 8 and Progress 8, uh, what young people have studied at for ages 14 and 15 is, is generally a, a less broad curriculum than they would have studied in the past, and that means that, that they have no, no pre-existing knowledge of what the breadth might look like post-16, so they don't know what they might like, and they don't know what they might be well-equipped to study, so the breadth that the colleges are able to provide is, is, is being constrained by that, by that pre-16 policy that is affecting the, the young people coming through the system as well, you know, a, a thing which, which those colleges in particular, you know, they have no impact, they have no, no control over. I think that's a relevant consideration, although we see good attainment, you know, at, at scores at key stage four, and, you know, that's, that's mm. good grades, as, as my colleagues have said, coming through the system, um, the, the breadth has, has definitely narrowed. Okay, and in terms of the um, uh, quality and outcomes for learners, depending on the different type of uh, provider types, so FE colleges, uh, sixth forms, and um, and college sixth form colleges. Um, so, is there any noticeable difference between those different types of institutions or, or sort of models? I think if you use, we talked earlier about value added, if you use value added measures, the, the most clear correlation is around size of institution, as, as James said. The size of institution. Um, if, you, if you take a provider neutral approach and look at value added. It's the size um, of the institution. It's, it, the, one of the main factors is size of institution, yeah. I mean, obviously it varies from institution to institution. There's, there's ups and downs, but nationally, globally, I think it's, it's, that's one of the main factors. Um, students who, you know, college students tend to have lower, point, lower prior achievement, and so they don't get some of the some of the. Mm. Um, um, you don't get the kind of average point scores you might get in a selective school, um, but that's that's to be expected. 
Uh, if you if you look like for like, it's I don't think there's many there's much difference. Okay, I'm trying to work out which of the questions I've got that have already been covered. I think it's been a very broad discussion that's mm. been quite dynamic, mm. so it's um, um, quite difficult to tell where we are. So I think I'll move on to T levels, um, if if that's okay, um, and uh, then come back to um, young people not in um, the NEETS, uh, which is obviously sort of something that um, is an issue. So how is the introduction of T-levels likely to affect outcomes for learners overall? It was touched on briefly earlier. And um, is, is the correct amount of funding available to T-levels and how can it best be spent to support good outcomes across the board? And obviously, it's, it's very early days, yeah. I think this, the starting point for this would be looking at the government's vision for technical education and it's been very clear that it wants a young person, the qualification of choice to use their language at the age of 16 is either an A-level or a T-level and fundamentally we, 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 we don't agree with that because as a group of qualifications, applied general qualifications, BTEX in the kind of uh, the, the best well-known brand, and we feel that they, are, they should be an integral part of the kind of qualification landscape in the, in the future. So we're concerned that when you look across level three now, for example, probably around 9% of students are doing a technical course, which T-levels will effectively replace. So I suppose our concern is twofold. One is that there's a lot of money. Kevin talked earlier about the 18-year-old funding cut. There's a huge amount of funding being targeted at T-levels. Our concern is the opportunity cost of that funding, funding that's going into a major flagship government policy it's funding that's not going into mainstream uh, students doing A-levels and BTECs. Uh, and secondly, and our, big, our bigger concern is the future of these qualifications, particularly in London. These are real enablers of social mobility. Mm -hmm. um, employers like them as well because they, they equip students with the skills that they need to get on as well. So we do have concerns about the kind of the, the focus uh, on T-levels. We're, we're supportive of them and hope that they will work. Um, but we are a bit concerned that applied general qualifications will get squeezed out. And the final thing I would say, and this is to a certain extent the government has created a rod for its own back here, the work experience or the work placement requirement for T-levels is very significant. 45 to 60 days, there have been some flexibilities introduced, but even in a place like London, um, it's questionable whether the employers are actually there to offer these placements. And if you don't do the placement, you don't, do the you don't get the qualification. Okay. So I think that's a really practical barrier that we'll need to keep a close eye on. Mike, who's responsible for finding those placements? Yeah, if I was going colleges. to step in there. The, um, the colleges that have piloted T-levels have given the advice that um, for finding that work experience, you need a member of staff that lives, sleeps, eats and breathes T-levels. Mm -hmm. You don't just expect a teacher in a few hours that they've got in their spare time to be phoning around employers. You need specialist staff that are actually developing those relationships. So it would be someone similar to the old work experience coordinator that we used to have in schools that used to spend their time building relationships mm -hmm. with local businesses and doing that. I don't see much evidence that money is going into that area. I see evidence that money is going to be spent retraining teachers, but they're not thinking about the wider, the point of the course is that it's different to what goes on before. And so yeah. you do need specialist trained staff who can actually develop Does anybody that have that specialist trained scarf? Is, 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 is that something that other people on the panel have, have I, noted? I, I'm not sure I, I, I necessarily agree fully with, with Lita to, in, in terms of the there is additional funding within T levels that that a young person will attract by because of the work placement, and you could argue that it's insufficient. But you could also argue that an institution like a college could dedicate that funding to employing somebody to do that role. I do think it's it seems to be insufficient, um, but I, I, I think focusing on that and focusing on any part of a T-level is, is the wrong focus. And it's James's focus that, this, that, that all of, there's a lot of negativity coming out around T-levels. For example, this, is, this could be one of the issues because of the fact that there is this view within the sector that other qualifications will just be pulled to force T levels through, and that that is that is the, hu the the huge point about a qualification that is attracting negativity when it should be attracting 
more positive, more top positive reasons. But, but if but if people are feeling that the um, young people concerned are basically at risk of not getting their qualifications because there may not be yeah. that option for them to get the work experience without which they will not get their qualification, then presumably that's where some of the scepticism comes in. But I mean. The, Colleges could, and maybe this is more for, for, for Eddie, I don't know, but I don't, for, for Lee's point, uh, colleges could could target or ring fence that money for the work experience coordinator. Could, could they not, do you think? They could. They could. So maybe they the would? issue is could they, would they, would they? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a would they, and maybe yeah. that's something that we yeah, can maybe. take take back, because I think that it feels slightly high risk to leave that to young people. They only have one shot at their education, albeit people can go back and do stuff later. But it, it, it does feel like something that potentially there could be a clearer steer in terms of the funding that actually that there is an expectation that you, you have something bespoke in place or do you not think that's necessary? I mean, I think I'm all in favour of sort of people being enabled to use the money in the way they see fit. However, if a young person's chance of actually fulfilling the qualification that they're going for is at risk because the school isn't or the educational institution isn't choosing to spend it in that way that kind of feels like um, a, a potential risk for those young people mm. in terms of their futures um, so maybe we can take that up um, yeah. separately somehow chair I, I think Thank you. the t-level program um, the, I mean obviously there hasn't been a t-level yet no one's taken yeah. the t-level yet but the t-level implementation program is being very very closely managed um, it's relatively well funded and um, the training and the support that goes with it is being quite closely managed by the department and for example the industry placement element which is a big part of a, of a t-level um, is a precondition I mean, you, students won't do a t-level won't be enrolled on a t-level unless the industry placement is is in place and of the kind of standard that that um, that's required. So, so who's so, monitoring that? The department. Well, both the I mean, it's part of the requirement of the course that you, you you won't you know it won't be a T level unless it's got that that substantial element of industry placement. The the risk for for colleges um, is that because they're very substantial placements, where you know an employer might have offered you um, off offered it might have been equivalent to say two or three placements. The T level. Um, what they can offer is one placement. One so longer placement. The risk is 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 of is of fewer placements for other other young people. So that's yeah. that's one risk. But in a sense, the problem with with T levels is going to be about it. It's not the answer to everything. Mm. It's it's a it's an it's the answer to the question about let's have a high status technical yeah. route. But it doesn't solve um, the whole challenge of raising achievement for all all young people and we also have to look at the transition program which is going to be the pre t level program about preparing young people okay. to move to towards yeah. t levels well. i think this is a subject of a whole other meeting in terms of the future of technical oh, education I, I that, so i think i'm not idea. going to carry on this this line of questioning but it's fascinating because i think it it feels um obviously it's an early stage we all hope that um young people have the option of a whole range of different mm. options that to find the route that suits them. Mm. But I just think it's something that we might come back to in a, in a future yeah. meeting, Chair. I think the point that James made about, about Applied General is worth, worth keeping in mind, though, because I do think that there is a, a cohort of young people who are sort of going to get forgotten in, um, amongst the fanfare. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is that is really important. Yeah, too. but I think we can maybe park it for today and sort of yes, take it up well, separately. It, it yeah. feels like something we could yeah. um, potentially raise with yeah. Jules if it comes under his category as well. Thank you. Um, so um, the uh, going back to the um, uh, the young people uh, not in employment, education, or training. Um, How is the sector working to reduce the proportion of uh, so-called Needs and has this become more challenging or less challenging over time? I would say that, I mean, first of all, the level of genuine needs, 16 to 18, is is now low. Mm -hmm. um, and um, colleges, I said earlier, colleges pride themselves on being inclusive. Colleges work very, very hard to make sure that having enrolled a student that first of all, they're, they're generally not turning students away, but that having enrolled a student, they then um, do the follow-up work to make sure they're retained 
um, and succeed and thrive in college. So there's a very, very low level of exclusions from, from colleges. So that's, that's, that's at one end. In terms of those students who are needs, mm -hmm. colleges work very closely with local authorities to identify what the best provision is for them. Because it's such a small proportion, on the whole, they tend to be the most vulnerable mm. and the most hard to reach and hard to, to cater for uh, cohort. Um, and the cost of doing that is high. And I think there are some issues around what alternative provision, how alternative provision is funded post-16 mm. and what it looks like. Um, you know, I wonder whether you know, some people would argue for a kind of PRU type approach post-16, mm. new institutions that that specialise in 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 in, uh, in 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 catering for needs, um, colleges can do that work, and they have the expertise and the skills to do that work. But it needs to be funded at the kind of level, you know, we don't have PRU type funding. No. Um, but if there was that funding, um, you can have alternative provision within within a college setting, which is much more likely to lead to inclusion and to st provide stepping stones for, for 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 young people to make their way into you know, more mainstream provision. But I think, I'm afraid, I, I know we're, we're all saying funding, 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 but I think it does come down to funding. Um, but uh, that's really about working with local authorities about creating provision which can meet the needs of, of these students. We're now talking about a few percent, um, and we're in that territory of very vulnerable learners, learners who have, you know, complex issues, um, they may be known to the police. They may be, you know, there's, they may be homeless. You know, there's all sorts mm. of issues which need you need a multi-agency approach. That's all possible. It can all be done, and colleges can do that. But it needs serious investment. And I, I don't think that new new alternative provision post 16 is the answer. I think working with colleges would be a better way. Okay, thank you. I think um, it's interesting that the sixth form colleges in London are quite different in character to the sixth form colleges outside. London and one of the one of the characteristics is there's more level one provision more level two provision and that's partly because they're trying to do the right thing uh, in terms of the local community but I also think it's probably partly because of how many more school sixth forms there are in London relative to mm. the other parts of the country that balance we talked about earlier the 60 40 in reverse um, because what that means is and it um, again I'm going to talk about funding as Eddie says um, Sixth form colleges give second chances, as FE colleges do as well, and we do see a good number of students that have a bad first year in a school sixth form, then come to a sixth form college or an FE college, then get hit with this three-year, third-year, 18-year-old funding reduction as well. So there is something about sort of probably the advice and guidance that goes in to where you go post-16 anyway to make sure you get the right fit, because if you get it wrong, it can be quite high stakes. Mm. Okay, thank you. I think a lot of our members do say as well that uh, somebody's left school and has been enticed to go to the go to the colleges, and they may not have the best experience and want to go back to the school sixth form and can't because they've missed the fifteenth of October, which is the census cut off time, etc. So they, it does, I think that that argument, to be fair, maybe it does go it does go both ways, mm -hmm. James. I'd, I'd have to throw that one, but I don't know if if, if um, this still applies. But some of our members say that in London in particular, it is more difficult to identify NEETs than other parts of the country for the very simple reason that somebody can leave Hammersmith and Fulham and go to Harrow College or some, for example, if that young person drops out at Harrow College, who notifies, do you notify Harrow Borough or do you notify Hammersmith and Fulham and who picks it up and who runs with it when it's not alone? Mm -hmm. I think that's because just for the very fact of the number of local authorities and the way that kids cross boundaries, it's probably more difficult to track needs in a larger institution than it is in one in, in for example the example of Hampshire so I don't, I don't know if that, that's certainly our view. Okay thank well, we you. We just um, completed a piece of work looking at the post-16 trajectories of young people through study and I think the points that each of these three colleagues have made is correct there is a group of young people who, who take a you know fairly normal standard um, route through through the post-16 landscape and they're fine <laughs> by some measure and they don't they don't bother that sort of neat statistic at all but there are the young people who have a, a difficult or different journey for whatever reason and Scott, sixth form colleges will sometimes pick those up 
FE colleges will sometimes pick those up, schools will sometimes pick those up, um, but the CIAG, the careers advice that goes behind it, is, is really key, and that's definitely a thing which I think needs to be sort of focused on and thought about a lot more in the pre-16 area. So what are those young people being talked about pre-16 that is preparing them to make a decision that is sensible and effective post-16? We accept that young people are allowed to change their mind, but hopefully, if they had better advice and guidance pre-16, that they might they might embark upon something that was more useful to them in the first place, and then they might not struggle against these problems of 18-year-old funding, uh, having to be picked up at non-census time points, having to you know go through sort of uh, transition processes to be picked up by colleges to have their baseline assessments done and those sorts of things uh, outside of cycles that, that would ordinarily be working. I think that is a that's a that's a thing that we can think about a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Tony? Yeah. <coughs> it's really for, uh, uh, for Lee. Um, if, if you could tell us briefly the effect of um, different salary levels and terms of contract in traditional uh, FE colleges as opposed to six forms and six form colleges. How is that affecting comparative recruitment? Um, I mean, it's very, very difficult. It's more difficult for the teaching unions because um, there's a teaching shortage, whereas our staff are more likely to be facing redundancy and losing their job because of that. But that doesn't mean that they shouldn't be paid decent money or be on decent terms and conditions. Um, I don't know how much you know about how pay works in the FE sector, but unlike in schools and unlike in sixth form colleges, uh, there's no national negotiating body that makes a recommendation that is accepted by all colleges. We have a national negotiating body, I'm on it, and it makes a recommendation and colleges are free to choose to give the recommendation or not. The recommendation has been pretty low for a number of years. It's been 1% uh, for the last couple of years. It was zero before that. So the pay rises that have been given are lower than what's being offered in mm. other sectors as it is. And that's what's causing the sort of big pay differentials to start emerging. Um, in London, a fair few colleges, actually, it's not too bad, do give the recommendation. But what we're seeing is every year fewer and fewer colleges are. And we've got um, examples of colleges that haven't made any cost of living pay rise whatsoever for nearly 10 years. There's colleges in London that haven't made any cost of living pay rise for nine years to their staff. And I think there's very, very few people in any sectors that are working under those sorts of conditions. If I speak about support staff, there's the double whammy for them that there's a currently a consultation out saying, um, let's offer FE colleges the chance not to, at the moment, they have to put them in the local government pension scheme. There's currently a consultation to say that they're not going to have to do that for new staff anymore. So that's another condition that they'll be losing. So what we are finding is colleges are having to negotiate individually sort of their pay rises, which is a job that doesn't need to be done. You know, most um, colleges are members of the Association of Colleges, and the reason they do that is they would they pay their membership fees because they would like their association to be able to negotiate a good salary for them. You know, the, the employer side want that as well. It's not just the union side. It's just that it's been left far more open to the market than the rest of the education system has been. I, I appreciate that you're principally concerned with non-teaching staff. Can I ask the others? Uh, do the sixth form colleges and sixth forms in schools find it easier to recruit because salaries are higher, I guess, on average there than in FE colleges? which means, if you like, a leakage from staff who otherwise would have taught in FE colleges are now gravitating to teaching sixth form in schools, or is that too simplistic a, a way of looking at it? I suppose I would, I would make a distinction between uh, I would have sixth form college teachers and school teachers on one side and FE college lecturers on the yes. whole on the other. So from a sixth form college perspective, we fish in the same pond as schools do for staff. They're qualified uh, QTS, qualified teaching status, and that's what they do. So they, there is some mix in between schools and sixth form and sixth form colleges, and that's tend to be where we recruit from. I think FE colleges, the pay is lower, but it's a, often it's a different sort of role, different type of job. 
it's quite it's it's not unthought it's not unheard of, but it's quite unusual for sixth form colleges to re re uh, recruit in a big way from uh, staff that have been in FE colleges. I mean, that's as a general rule. So I think the issues that we have with recruitment are around certain subjects, maths and sciences being the obvious ones. So the issues that you have in schools in terms of subject teachers and recruitment are mirrored in sixth form colleges and may be slightly different to what happens in FE. Does it, it suggests that there isn't parity of esteem from what you're saying. Uh, uh, if, if I can simplify it, uh, there is more esteem if you're teaching in a sixth form college or you're teaching in a school sixth form than teaching in an FE college. Is I that fair? I think it's one of the things I would just say is, uh, before you go to Eddie would be to say that the, the, the curriculum is very different. There's a vanishingly small amount of A-level, for example, taught in FE colleges. So on the whole, what we teach are A-levels and kind of beats. So the curriculum in FE colleges is, is often quite different. So it's, whether it's to do with esteem or not, I think it's mainly to do with they're just different beasts delivering quite a different offer. Yeah, I'm, 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 I think I might dispute the vanishingly small <laughs> uh, description. There's quite, quite a lot of A-level being taught in, in FE colleges. But in, in FE colleges, I'd say 5% is pretty small. Yeah, I'm... I'm I mean, I'm not sure about that, but to, to, I to a lay person, and, and I'm a lay person, if I was in, <coughs> if I was in a school, and I wanted to, to keep my sixth form and to keep it economic, given the lower level of uh, fees which, which which they're getting for the 16 to 19, I would want to take A levels, particularly in those subjects which um, are not demanding on resources, which yeah. simply require a whiteboard, uh, you know. Uh, 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 things like that rather than a laboratory or equipment uh, uh, and things of that sort and manifestly um, that work really supporting what you're saying is being uh, leaked away from the FE colleges is that fair that schools are looking for the ones uh, the courses which have the lowest overheads I think it's unfair to say they're looking for those courses <laughs> that have got the lowest overheads but it is fair to say that they are more likely to teach the courses that have got the lowest overheads. So for example, they tend not to touch the high cost engineering and uh, whatever, you know, all the other technical and vocational subjects that FE colleges specialize in. There, there is a, I think there's a danger in thinking that you can um, put, that you're a supply led model where you just put on the courses and the kids will come because you could put on all of the lowest cost A levels in, in the world. And uh, if the kids don't want to do it, they, they won't come. Oh, well, I, I get this, uh, <laughs> as, so, as, as, so, so certainly I understand that. I think it's true that, that where schools are um, trying to move into vocational provision, they will tend to offer those courses that have lower um, kind of uh, laboratory workshop equipment type costs. I think on the whole they do it with integrity, but, but there's not a lot of that provision in, in schools. and, and you can't expect a school really to invest in engineering or motor vehicle or, or, or hairdressing um, because the capital outlay is, is too great. But going, moving on to the teacher costs, I think James, James is right in the sense that um, the job is a different job. I mean, we'd be the first as the employer organisation to say that FE teachers are not paid enough. You know, that it's, it's a consequence of the, the funding squeeze. But it is a different job. Um, when I moved from being a school teacher to being an FE teacher, you, you're joining a sector where there's this whole um, range of work that you've not done at school. You know, you're teaching adults, you're teaching vocational courses. In many cases, you're a dual professional. You know, you're a plumber and a teacher. You know, all these all these um, aspects of FE make it a um, a different environment, and in many ways, a, a more dynamic and more stimulating environment. However. Um, we, we would like our staff to be to be better paid, and we would like to have the resources to pay them better. Um, but there, but it is a it's a different job. I don't think it 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 has got lower esteem or higher esteem. I think it's just a a different environment and a different different job. Is part of that you describe it as dynamisms? Um, is part of that dynamism uh, reflected in the different forms of contracts which are available in FE as opposed to schools, yep. i.e. If you like, there's a variation of the gig economy. People doing part-time uh, teaching in FE, which they would not be doing in a sixth form or in a sixth form college. 
Am I intruding on your question? No. Let us I'm, not sure it's the, I'm not sure I'd go as far as say it's the gig economy, but <laughs> I, sus I think, um, I'm not sure if I have the evidence for this, but I think that there are more, there's, there, are, there are more different types of contracts, more different types of roles, um, partly because of the vocational and technical um, aspect of what we do, where we need different kinds of professionals, and we need a mix of different kinds of professionals with different kinds of backgrounds and experience to deliver the programme. So yes, there's, there's, there's a diversity of, of contracts, um, and I think all, all employers in education are very conscious of the need to offer flexibility, but not the kind of flexibility that means you know, precarious and, and, and uh, insecure employment, because we, we don't want that. You talk about, you talk about uh, insecure jobs, but if it's providing a variety, I don't know, supposing I was a printer, and I work three days a week printing my local news. Of course, you don't print newspapers these days, but you understand the point I'm making. I spend two days a, 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 a week in the college. Is that uh, uh, going to be, uh, how should I put it, a far more enriching job than uh, simply doing one or the other, and therefore is going to be attractive to... Um, tradesman, if you like. I, I think it's, it, it, it depends on the sector, but for example, in the media and performing arts, there's a long tradition of yeah. practitioner, you know, whether it's web designers, whether it's digital, digital, um, um, digital workers, uh, whether it's uh, artists, um, whether it's performers who are also teaching in their local college. And that's that's a good thing because it, it enriches both the educational experience and the, the, the college environment and mm -hmm. it informs their practice. So that's, that's not, that maybe in some cases it may be a necessity because you can't actually earn a, a decent living doing one or, yeah. one or the other full time, but actually it's a, it, that's an enriching thing. And that applies in, in some other areas. But we do find that in engineering in particular and IT, uh, recruitment difficulties because colleges are, find it very hard to offer the kind of yeah. salary uh, to a teacher to the kind of people who have the industry experience and can command much you know much higher salaries so there are there are specific uh, sectors where it's really hard to recruit in effect therefore that's the only way you can recruit such specialists if you employ them on a part-time basis or offer them or offer them you know or offer them better pay Interesting. Yeah, the one area that um hasn't been mentioned where there is direct competition between schools and FE is English and maths because of the requirement that all students study to later. Particularly maths. Maths is, a, is, a, is an area of, 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 of um, recruitment problems. If I can move on, uh, again it relates to financing. Um, <coughs> I think a couple of you have kind of boasted that there have been mergers but it hasn't affected the number of campuses. How sensible is that? I think it varies. It's horses for courses, really. I mean, I've, I've, I've talked about... I, I just didn't want to give the impression that when, a, when a, a number of colleges merge to form a group, that there's a radical, you know, loss of campuses. There will be a rationalisation. There will be a look yes. at what campuses are for, where they are, what they do, how they serve their communities. So I, I, I think sometimes the right thing to do is to close a campus, but... Colleges are very conscious of serving serving their communities, and I, I talked earlier about the the, um, the need of um, for entry level and level one students, students who are still finding their feet in the system, to have a campus, you know, to have a, a, a campus near home, and a relatively short journey to, to college. Colleges are very conscious of that, so it might be about redesigning the campus, or or you know, shrinking or expanding a campus. I mean, I use the example of Atley because it's a, it's a very good example of being creative with an existing campus to meet a, um, a, a need in two boroughs, effectively Hackney and Tower Hamlet. I mean, I take, I, I mean, I, I take a point about horses for courses, but it's obviously um, economies of scale. It does not make, it doesn't, of course this was the argument for setting up the six form colleges because six forms mm -hmm. in schools were too small and the idea was to aggregate them together. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and clearly on, on, on the face of it, it worked. And now of course there's been this reaction to it uh, and I'm astonished that none of you have mentioned academies and academy chains who, uh, uh, you know, seem to have uh, spotted an opportunity for six forms in, in, in schools. But uh, on the face of it, particularly in London, and we've already drawn attention to the fact of 
uh, the ease of travelling in London. My constituency uh, actually um, has almost no uh, underground stations at all. So I, 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 find, I, I find that a difficult concept. But in, but, but in, but in most of London, where, where travelling um, really is very easy and we have the system of passes, which you've already talked about, and things of, things of that kind, it doesn't make sense to have two uh, under-resourced uh, campuses at all. And one way of releasing money into the system, which I, which I understand academies are seeking to do, um, it, it is related to rationalising um, the estate. Uh, it, is there a suggestion that that's not happening? No, I think I think it. I think where it's sensible, it is happening. But um, the key word there is sensible because you've got to think about um, who who your learners are, how far they're prepared to travel, and the specialisation. You know, in some cases, you might you might have a small campus that is highly specialised and it has all the kit you need. An A-level campus needs to have the full range of A-levels in the sing single campus because students are moving between subjects. So it, th there isn't a single rule of thumb that you can apply. But believe me, colleges are working hard to, to sweat, the, <laughs> sweat the assets uh, that they have. Um, and the, if we're looking for inefficiencies in, in the estate, I think we need to look elsewhere. You know? I think Eddie's completely right. And it's another example of how schools and colleges are treated differently. So just going back to the area review process, we were told then as sixth form colleges that 1,200 students is too small, that even having 1,000 students, you're not viable. Mm. And at the mm. same time, in this city, 16 to 19 free schools with 200 or 300 students yeah. were being approved. So to a certain extent, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, but I think it, there is something about how colleges are treated and how viability is determined for colleges and how schools and free schools in particular are regarded uh, as well. Of course, that varies. I mean, I look at the Imperial College Math School, uh, which is very tiny um, and is incredibly successful. Um, you know, if one is talking about choice in the capital, either you, either you go to, you know, the big sixth form college, which pr has provision right across mm. uh, all academic disciplines, or you concentrate on particular disciplines, uh, yeah. you know. Um, that's a, not a, really a discussion for this panel. But it does relate to what you're saying about you, are you suggesting that uh, a place which is very small might not necessarily be a good thing. And I suggest to you that the two maths uh, colleges which we have in London do, do appear to be extremely successful mm. um, as far as that's concerned. If I, if I can lastly uh, talk about the mayor's investment uh, in FE in excess of 100 million, which he's proposing to invest in this state, uh, what do you think the money should be spent on specifically? What is the one thing? Um, that that money should be spent on, which the mayor is now going to control. Well, capital. Do any of you have a like, view? Yes, like, like revenue, capital is a great incentivizer, um, and it's and it's a, it's a bit like convening. We talked about convening power earlier. It's a bit like convening power. It can make things happen. So yes. I, my suggestion would be that, um, and I think my former college benefited from some um, some mayor's uh, capital investment. Um, I, my suggestion would be that. To be, to be successful um, in a capital bid to the mayor's fund, there should be a strategic case uh, which makes sense beyond just that single institution. In other words, it should be part of a plan or a strategy for subject X, provision X, or you know, um, course X in an area, and it should meet a need which is wider than just the college needing to improve its facilities. So that, that would be my test, and I think if, if you start to ask those questions, you'll get some good projects which will have a real impact on, on, on provision to students, because obviously the pot is limited, and the rest you, you can't upgrade all, all the whole estate at the, the yes, same presume time. Presumably the rest of you agree with that. Would, the money should be spent strategically. It, it should, but I also think there's a question about national versus mayoral as well, in terms of how to deal with the demographic bulge. So the number of 16 to 18-year-olds is going to absolutely rocket over the next few years. I mean, national, I mean, in some London, but Havering, I think, is looking at 30% increase. I mean, so again, there's something about schools and colleges. Are, we don't want to be asleep at the wheel nationally, and that's our concern, that are there going to be enough places for the number of young people, whether they're in schools or in colleges? Uh, and because there is a significant number of extra places that are going to be needed, and there's just some clarity about whose responsibility and who's going to find the money for that, and how the capital money 
is going to be spent because nationally there is barely any capital funding. The capital funding nationally is lamentable. So in the absence of that, it might be that the money that the mayor has could be used. Yeah. I, I would say that's a really important point to differentiate. There are demographic issues in London that over the next few years very likely to have an awful lot more young people in 16 to 19. In some ways, I'm sure you don't want the mayor's 100 million doing the government's job and <laughs> subsidising what should be put in from separate government pots. Uh, some of our members who work in London would feel that what needs to be done with money like that, that it needs to address the particular problems that 16 to 19 year olds may be experiencing. One of those is undoubtedly around knife crime, issues like that, mental health. We've seen how they are the first, often the first line of staff, we've talked about this, to be, to be cut. And if there was some, I know this is supposed to be capital money, but there are facilities that can be built within college sites that can be an amalgam of capital and kind of revenue salary expenditure to try and make schools, sixth forms and colleges maybe the safer places, replacing the youth clubs that have been destroyed, etc. That those, those some, something like that, I think a lot of our members would be in favour of. Yes, I mean, coming back, Phil, Kevin, you know, um, as a, a parent, carer and um, speaking to many of my constituents around education, um, they don't really care who the fund holder is. They just want the big issues sorted. Um, and so, you know, um, playing the issue down the middle, um, if, like is government funding versus mayoral funding, is, is really not helpful. I, I, I agree, but uh, it? it would be nice to have the 100 million spent on top of the other money that one is entitled to. <laughs> That's yeah. all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, look, this, uh, can I just say, personally, I think you've been one of the most informative panels that we've had, but then when you bring like experts like yourself into this room, uh, a little wonder. Um, so, you know, highly informative responses to our questions. I think uh, the panel members will agree. Mm. And you've highlighted um, aspects of this really highly complex 16 to 19 year old education world um, that I think we've got to pick up those points you've highlighted and then decide how we actually go and do a little bit more questioning about. Um, so, um, if I can ask, once we've done a lot more work internally, will it be okay for us to come back to you to seek further clarifications of some points that we've touched on, but we'd like a little bit more information on? Would that be okay? Cool. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you very much um, for your contribution here today. Um, and, um, you know, congratulations on all that you do. Um, for London's young people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, members, um, let's see if we can get this uh, last few items through. Um, can you note the report and the discussion and delegate authority to me as chair to agree any outputs from the discussion? Um, can you note the panel's work programme for the remainder of the assembly year? Noted. And um, the next meeting of the panel is scheduled to be held on 2nd February. Um, and um, I'll have to get back to you because the subject has just left, left the brain. Um, but uh, we'll be meeting on the 2nd of February. And just have to say, it's three days before my birthday. So if Tony wants to bring me some chocolates, <laughs> because I've spent my life bringing him chocolates, be really appreciated. And um, uh, last item, um, any other business um, that I consider urgent, and there is no business, no, uh, that doesn't apply. So bang the gong. Thank you very much.